Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tony Roskilly. I'm Professor of Energy Systems at Durham University and a Director of Durham Energy Institute. And um, this uh, event is organised by the EPSRC network, H2 Hydrogen Field Transportation. It's part of a series of webinars that look at different aspects of hydrogen research in the transport sector. This month, we're delighted to welcome from Mark Brand. Um, he's a research fellow in the Applied Aerodynamics Group at Loughborough University. Um, he is, his primary research interest lies in the application and development of optical measurement techniques for gas turbine development and improving component and system subsystem design. So over to you, Mark. Yeah, so I work at the National Centre for Combustion Aerothermal Technology, which is based at the University of Loughborough. Um, the NCAT, as we call it, is, uh, is a development. It was a, um, opened in 2019, and it was a development uh, partnership between the Aerospace Technology Institute through Innovate UK um, and Bayes, Rolls-Royce and Loughborough University. Um, our our primary remit is associated with technology development. And we do that in a unique way for the UK. We're able to operate at very, very uh, fundamental level, understanding the fundamental physics associated with um, uh, aerothermal technology supporting combustion and related processes, right up to supporting direct development and engine certification. And there's a specific example of this. Um, at, at, all aerospace technology has to be certified and accredited that it's safe to use before it goes into operation. Um, and we're able to, to support conditions running at very high altitude, so stimulate very high altitude conditions in the combustor, with very low temperatures um, and low pressures, sub-atmospheric pressures, right through to simulating conditions that are broadly representative of the takeoff condition at the very opposite end of the, of the engine cycle. So, what I want to do today is a few things. I'm going to try and cram them all in. So to start with, just to, to sort of pose the question, why, why are we so interested in hydrogen for aerospace? Why does it make sense? And what are the challenges? And then what are we doing here at NCAT in that area? Uh, and then I'm going to show you a couple, some of the stuff we've been working on related to a couple of projects we've got, um, got just starting, which tries to understand how the combustion physics works. It's quite a nice little study for... Uh, for, for a particular um, a particular architecture that's of significant interest, um, especially academically right now, uh, which is called Micromix. So it's quite exciting. And then I'll show you some some um, some work we're doing to develop optical techniques to better understand hydrogen flames, which is really exciting. Hydrogen flames being invisible makes it quite a difficult challenge for for understanding their behaviour optically. So just to start with a bit of perspective where aerospace sits in terms of the total UK carbon emissions. Um, aerospace obviously sits within the transport sector, which is a significant proportion of, of net carbon emissions. Um, and it's largely, uh, there's such a focus on um, carbon, uh, carbon reduction from transport because it's it is to a large extent um, uh, manageable, um, manageable through engineering uh, and design. Aerospace itself occupies a relatively small slice of that, about 15% total, with around half a percent, um, half a percent domestic aviation and the majority international. OK, so you might be thinking, as I say this, why, why the focus on on what, why so much money involved in decarbonizing aerospace when it's such a small piece of the pie? And the reality is it's a very, very difficult problem okay so to illustrate this this is a page i found uh, managed to find it's the operating manual so i think that gets given to the pilot it's the operating manual for a 787-10 so it's a large civil airliner and what this shows you is basically the performance uh, the performance of the aircraft so on the x-axis here we have range how far the aircraft can fly and on the y-axis i mean it's not quite but, but this is really pretty well payload okay and those two factors really define the profitability of an aeroplane, okay? So your carrier, he, they, they want to fly either more people or fly fewer people further. That's how they, make, how they make their money. And the performance of the aircraft is very sensitive to the, to the base weight, 
So if we have a given takeoff weight, we what this shows you is if you've got a given takeoff weight, so we put some amount of fuel on, you can either fly uh, a short distance with a large payload or a large distance with a with a long with with sorry a long distance with a small payload. If we change the aircraft weight, the permissible payload range decreases, and the air, the, the the carrier can choose either to reduce their range or reduce their payload. Either way, whether you're sending a parcel or or, or traveling. The, the ticket or the or the or the shipping duty cost you cost you more okay and nobody wants that the bottom line of all of this is if we are going to decarbonize propulsion systems in aerospace okay they have to compete with current in-service designs to be competitive and to actually achieve any real carbon reduction so how do we understand that well anyone who's done um, anyone who's done a degree in aer aeronautics will know the breguet range equation it's a very basic way to parameterize how how um, how how payload and range are traded off against other aircraft parameters. If we assume the aircraft doesn't change and we just change the fuel out to take the carbon out of that fuel we're burning, okay, we can simplify this to say our range is just proportional to this this fuel property. And what delta H is, it's the amount of energy you release into the gas stream when you burn the fuel. It's very simple. We can then start looking. At different fuels and, and this delta H, some people call it gravimetric energy density or calorific value or whatever, but it's basically for a given energy output, how heavy the fuel you have to carry around is. People are also very concerned about how compact the fuel is, your volumetric energy density, because on an aeroplane, you don't want to significantly change the architecture to store your fuel. And if it's very bulky, it would require you to do that. So we can then look at different fuel categories. So we find batteries uh, occupy down here. It's sort of that they're, they're moderately to not very compact and they're not very light whatsoever, which makes them a poor, a poor candidate for long range flight. Gaseous fuels, they have, they're, they're very lightweight fuels typically, but they're not particularly compact. So it would require radical changes to the aircraft design. Liquid fuels, so jet fuel you can see at this point here, they're, they're very compact and, and they're also relatively light. If we look at liquid hydrogen, it presents a real strategic advantage because of its potential in terms of how light it is for the energy released, okay? But it suffers in terms of its compactness. So other fuels, so for example, ammonia, typically will perform worse than hydrogen. And that really is why there is the focus in in hydrogen as a potential for the aerospace sector. It has the ability to impact the international market segment, which really is um, the major contributor from aerospace to carbon emissions. For, for short duration or short pay, small payload flights, uh, it's likely batteries will, will, will completely dominate that, um, dominate that sector in a net zero world. And short term, the current broad consensus, although there is still some debate around this as the technology is not yet in service, that that's drop in replacement fuels will, will replace at the very long range, the longest range flights for intercontinental travel. Okay. So in terms of the puzzle for how you operate a gas turbine, the question is not just around profitability, how well the engine will uh, integrate with the aircraft system and deliver its mission. It's additionally knock-on effects, which are currently uh, legislated. That relates primarily to pollutant emissions and hydrogen is extremely attractive when compared to other fuels. Okay, so there's this is uh, this is from a recent um, a recent review report that supports some of the conclusions of the previous slide, but that gives a direct breakdown by different fuel types, and I've summarised it here just as a comparison between jet A1 and hydrogen for all the various pollutant emissions we currently worry about today. Hydrogen doesn't produce any of them apart from NOx. It's fundamentally a clean combustion process, so it has tremendous potential to support other. Um, other societal issues associated with current aerospace transport. But there are challenges. Hydrogen, I mean, hydrogen is a unique, is a, is a unique fuel. And there are a few things that this is, in terms of its, um, in terms of its thermo thermodynamic dynamic properties, this is the tip of the iceberg, but it just illustrates some points I want to make later on. It has extremely wide flammability limits and a very high flame speed. What that means is it burns very easily. And when it burns, it burns very fast. So if you're trying to introduce it into a combustion chamber, it's very likely the flame will propagate upstream into the thing 
that you're, you're pushing the hydrogen through. Hydrogen flames are also very high temperature. So first of all, when that flame gets inside a component, it's very, it would be damaged far more rapidly than with a, with a conventional kerosene flame. Uh, hydrogen flames, because they're hot, they also risk significantly higher NOx production if, if not carefully managed. And they have, it, the, the gas itself is very low density, which means how we introduce it to the combustor has to change, okay? So in the academic community right now, there's a lot of excitement around an area called micromix combustion. And this is basically where we, we take the existing injectors, which are relatively large scale, and we make them very small and have a very, very large number of them. OK, so we've been working on this techno technology for some time at NCAT. So this started in 2019 um, with a scoping study where we looked at what the technology areas and the potential solutions uh, could be for hydrogen. And that led directly into an IP generation project where a number of patents were filed covering various aspect aspects of, of um, hydrogen combustion and delivery to a gas turbine system and di directly fed also into a number of grant submissions which have been awarded um, and are, are just kicking off now. So of these, there, there are sort of two main things I'm going to talk, the three main things I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of this scoping study work we did and show how that feeds in to a couple of the projects um, I'm currently I'm currently leading the Loughborough University packages related to. So the first one's an EPSRC grant. Um, and attached to that, it's very, it's very interesting. We're try, we, as part of all of this process, we, we notice there's a, a real deficit of high quality validation data for modeling. So we're trying to attach to this, um, release an open access validation data set, and we've, we've, we've started engaging in that process already around 12 months ago. And also an EU program, again, looking at the fundamentals of how micromix combustion can support, um, can support aerospace applications. So just to start with, this is an example of a micromixer here. So what we've done is we've, we've got two jets exhausting into a chamber, okay? So we've put some fuel through the central jet here. And we've put some air through an outer jet and we've let it burn. And I've put some of the some of the parameters we've put there in case there's any modelers in the audience who are interested. This is basically our current best practice for modeling, uh, for modeling kerosene flames. We, we expect this probably is not appropriate for hydrogen combustion, but at present there's no knowledge as to what the appropriate, you know, what the best approach would actually be. And there's no significant validation data available. So there's a major hole in the market. Despite all of that, we're mixing two gas streams. And so by background, I'm actually a fluid dynamicist. Jet mixing is extensively studied and very well understood. And the mixing physics here really helps set up the conditions um, that, that define the combustion performance. And so using all of that, we can predict NOx performance um, for, for these kind of simple aero engine micromixers, okay? And the basic point we expect, if you go through that, uh, and we don't have time to talk through it all today, but if we, if we put all that together, what we find is we expect a linear trend of NOx with a geometric scale factor. So what I can do, I can take that model I just showed you, and I can run it at a bunch of scale factors, okay? And we can see, so all I've done is scale every geometric parameter. We've got the smallest one I can make here, and I scale them up two times, three times, four times scale, all the way up to 16 times scale. So, so what we find is that the overall structure of the heat release looks broadly similar as I increase the scaling between these, okay? Except for at the smallest scale, right? So I'm then able to extract out what our NOx emissions are at the exit of the combustor, and attempt and try to predict. So that's a very non-linear process, the NOx production. So we can then try to try to assess whether our very fundamental simple modeling allows prediction of the NOx. If it does, you should get a linear trend. And that's exactly what we find here. As we increase the scaling, there, there is this relationship with NOx emissions. So this, this kind of um, this kind of process really ex really uh, sort of explains what the benefit of potential benefit of micromixing is by making things small, you're able to reduce NOx emissions to a low level. Okay, and that's a, that's that's the real potential. So by using hydrogen combustion in aerospace, we're actually able potentially to reduce NOx emissions beyond where they are today despite the risks that are posed by the high flame temperatures.
Okay. So I started off by saying there's no validation data available. So these, these conclusions are all very preliminary so far. So our grants are, our grants are set up to provide experimental, um, experimental measurements to support that and to understand why this occurs, uh, why this occurs and what the trade-offs are with other parameters associated with, with the combustion process. So making the fuel injection site small, for example, will very likely reduce the NOx emissions you uh, the NOx emissions you incur, but will also make it more difficult for the fuel injector to light. So the, the question is why does why do all of those things um, happen? How does the physics add up uh, to, to provide the overall mixing performance and the combustion performance associated with it? In addition to this, we also have funding through the EU, which is a 22 partner project coordinated by SAFRAM. Um, the primary aim of this again is to support uh, to support how we make how to support improvements in the modeling process for hydrogen. This is currently, as I said, this is not well understood, and it's certainly not well understood to, to sufficiently well understood to develop the next generation of aerospace um, aerospace combustors. So our part of this is to perform an experimental study, rather than focusing on 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 a, the the, um, the 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 minute details of a single geometry. We're looking at a broader st study for a range of different injection concepts to evaluate what concepts would uh, 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 what what sorry what the combustion physics is so how the combustion physics associated with different fuel injection concepts supports uh, application in the aerospace industry in order to in order to um, truly understand how that feeds through into emissions performance we need to to test these more realistic gas turbine conditions and that means operating them at high pressure and high temperature in some of our uh, in some of our more advanced test facilities and again the goal is to improve understanding of how um, micromix geometries uh, operate and the, the, the physical processes underpinning them. Um, in addition to this, we've been looking at some of the optical techniques that you, you can use um, to, to understand a hydrogen flame. So I have a couple of examples here. This is a small, um, a very small burner we built in order to, in order to, um, in order to benchmark uh, and gain some experience burning these, these kind of different kind of flames. We've got a very small injection injection site that leads to the generation of this large flame. When you light this in the lab, it's more or less completely invisible. It's very, pretty much impossible to see with the naked eye. So what we've been doing is using advanced techniques to, to investigate how we can see the species that are formed at intermediate steps in the reaction from hydrogen to water. One of these that's very, that's very important is hydroxyl OH star. So it's a radical, it's only present in the flame. And, and what we did initially was to look at whether we could generate a simple butane flame that would have similar structure and similar scales to the hydrogen flame. You can see that's the case, even if, even if the precise details of how, how this important marker is distributed through the flame, if that changes. Okay, so we've then been looking at advanced techniques that we could potentially deliver. So the, the case on the left, um, personally, I think is very interesting. I said this is a gas density measurement um, using a technique called background oriented Schlieren. And so what we're able to see with this technique is there is a plume of gas delivered to the base of the flame where it anchors at this point here. And the, 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 at this point where, where the base of the flame forms, the neat fuel that's been injected into the air mixes with enough air that it can finally burn. It continues mixing, uh, mixing in the center of the flame, whilst around the edges, there, around the edges there is, that's really where the burning is taking place. And the contours you can see evolving are related to the thermal changes in the flame. We can confirm this by making laser-based measurements um, of the of the same geometry to look at where the where the flame um, where, where the where the flame is holding, which is what, what these contours are showing here, where the flame location is set inside the domain. 
Okay, so that's a, a very quick, uh, very quick introduction to the work to, to the aerospace and hydrogen combustion problem and some of the work we, that we're taking, taking on at NCAT. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mark, for a very interesting presentation.